Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Gavin Locke here. How are you today, Gavin? Good, thanks, Tracy, and thanks for the opportunity to have a chat. Um, of course, you're one of the leading large-scale global rare earth projects, and I want to ask you what you think has happened with Mollycor and Linus. What are you hearing out there in Australia? I guess uh, the two key issues are probably no surprise to anybody, and, and that sits around technical and, uh, and financial risks associated with any rare earth project. Um, uh, I guess uh, the production numbers that are being put out there are, are less than anticipated and forecast, which is understandable given commissioning issues that many plants have, um, but also the financial situation that many of us find ourselves in, us to a lesser extent because we're not at project finance yet. But uh, obviously the issues surrounded, um, surrounding the type of financing structures that they have in place are uh, obviously plaguing them at the moment and uh, we're working hard to try to avoid making those types of mistakes I guess. Do you think one of the advantages you're currently experiencing with Aerofura are all your many offtake relationships uh, that you currently have? Uh, well they're, they're part of it I think. Uh, it goes a long way to de-risk the project if you obviously have a big brother sitting in the background helping you out. Uh, to that extent, our largest shareholder in ECE um, has been extremely useful. They've been long and patient, long patient suffering shareholder for us, uh, and they've, you know, they injected thirty million dollars when the company needed it most. So uh, we're forever grateful for that. But also importantly, they're they're actually providing us with introductions to a range of um, technical experts within China. Um, who are assisting us in our in, in reducing our technical risks. So they certainly have gone a long way to, to helping us, uh, I guess, avoid some of the issues that some of the others may be uh, experiencing. Of course, <clears throat> one of those challenges are environmental permitting. Can you tell us a little bit where, about where you're at with this presently? Sure. Uh, like most rare earth uh, organisations, we have some radioactivity associated with, with the ore body, uh, so it does create some, uh, I guess, an, a more onerous social responsibility on all of us. And uh, we've uh, submitted our environmental impact uh, assessment to the uh, Department of uh, Environment in the ENT, uh, the Northern Territory of Australia, that is. And uh, we've received uh, feedback and public comment, and we're now amending our current process so that we can submit our final uh, license to operate uh, next year. And uh, we think that that is a very important uh, matter for potential customers and, and potential financiers that uh, you seem to have your social license to operate, which your EIS is part of. You know, you're considered one of the leaders in the rare earth industry. You speak around the world and you're in Asia uh, frequently. Can you tell us if you can confirm some of the rumors we're hearing that the Chinese are applying uh, downward pressure on rare earth prices? Um, well, I can't confirm or deny that. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, history has shown that that has, has occurred in the past. But uh, is it happening right now? I, I can't comment on that. And I, I don't have that intel. Uh, I wish I could uh, inform you, uh, uh, get, provide more information on that. What I do know is that um, given the, the, the restructuring of the rare earth industry within China, we now have uh, six large organisations that are mandated by, by Beijing to control the uh, supply process of rare earths out of China. And I think rare earth prices are probably being affected at the moment because of uh, the surplus inventories that are still in China from all those industries that have been closed down or are in the process of being shut down. And that information is consistently uh, being told to us by both uh, people within China, and that's uh, customers alike, as well as uh, potential customers in the rest of Asia. We have a lot of interest at Investor Intel about uh, electric vehicles, and of course uh, their batteries require neodymium, and you have one of the best uh, neodymium resources in the world. Can you give the Investor Intel a bit of a background on what and how unique your resource is and how you might be affected by this demand presently? Sure. Um, look, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, a resource that's enriched in, in that key magnet feed. Um, 
the, the magnets are, are certainly the or the ND and PR is certainly the backbone of any magnet, and for that reason, we are extremely bullish on uh, on the outlook there. All forecasts across the industry and out, inside and outside the industry uh, expect demand to grow for these magnets uh, in the order of 10 to 15 percent. So, you know, we're we're looking at positioning ourselves as a as a key magnet producer for the future. Um, I, I must refer actually to uh, nine years ago I joined Arafura and uh, one of our major German shareholders uh, told me at the time that it's all about the neodymium and I didn't quite get uh, get the get the picture at that point in time but certainly uh, I do now and uh, and I think we are starting as you, as we've recently done to report our costs against per kilogram of neodymium and I think that's important for the industry to start realigning itself um, into its key market sectors rather than just uh, promoting itself as a rare earth general, generalistic player. And of course you've done a great deal to uh, reduce your capex and opex cost and have received accolades from analysts like Christopher, uh, Christopher Ecclestone. Can you, provide me, can you provide us with any additional updates on this? Um, uh, only that it's always an ongoing process. Uh, we're not comfortable with uh, where our current capital uh, and operating costs are. The operating costs are significantly improved and, and that's a great credit to our team. And, uh, you know, we look forward to even trying to bring that down even further with our, our Chinese uh, optimization process. The capital constraint still remains our biggest issue uh, and that's the biggest issue for financing. So, you know, we're, we're always looking at ways to chip away at that and, uh, you know, I'd love to see it under a billion dollars but uh, at the same time, uh, I guess if you look at uh, Linus and Molly, both of their projects are north of a billion dollars for, for similar tonnages. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep working at that and, uh, and see where we get to. Well, I've got to tell you, it's a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, Gavin, for joining us this evening. You're welcome. No problem, Tracy. Thanks very much.